What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. A lot of people have been asking me for content like this, so here it is. This is five tips for low income investing and one cutting edge investment idea. So for starters, what is low income investing? So this topic is for people who feel like they don't have a lot of discretionary income. That's extra income at the end of the month after they've paid all their bills and their mortgage and their car payment and everything. What's left at the end of the month is called discretionary income. And a lot of times, oftentimes, that money is where your investment funds would come from. So a lot of people are actually gonna be in this boat. You could be making $40,000 a year or you could make $200,000 a year and still fit into this category. Most of you folks that are watching this and are saying, hey, that's me, the vast majority, are probably gonna be in the lower income tiers. Maybe you're making 30,000, 40,000, $50,000 a year, and it's not seeming like you can get by because that's not a ton of money, especially with the record inflation that's happening right now. Now, on the other hand, you can make $200,000 a year, and maybe you're the only working parent, so the wife stays home, you've got 10 kids, you've got a lot of expenses, everybody's playing sports, so you're making $200,000 a year, and it's just not cutting it. There's also regional factors. So if you live in San Francisco, $200,000 a year isn't a ton of money. But if you live in rural Oklahoma, that should be more than enough to get by. So whatever the case may be, you feel like you don't have enough money at the end of the month to make large investments, but you really want to start and you're trying to figure out how. Now, a lot of people think, hey, you have to have money to make money. And that's not always true. You have to have money to make money, but then also know what you're doing with that money. The truth is money won't solve all your problems. Most people who win the lottery go broke. And a lot of people wonder why that is. Literally 70% of people who win the lottery, whether it's a million or 50 million, go broke in five years or less. So just having money all of a sudden isn't the solution. If you're not a good investor now and you don't know what you're doing, having money will not change that. The fact is that a lot of people that are broke have a broke mindset. So if you hand them a large lump sum of money, eventually, in five years or less, obviously, they're gonna go broke and that's because they haven't developed the mindset and good habits that they need to be a profitable investor. So I'm lucky enough to have gone through this whole process. I've gone through several periods in life where I was broke and I had to work really hard to come out on top. So now that I've reached a certain status in my life, right? I live in a nice house. We drive nice cars. We live in a good neighborhood so my kid can go to the good schools. I do quite a bit of investing on the day to day. So people see that and they come to me for advice. The conversations usually start out the same. It's either, hey, I've got 500 bucks. I want to invest it. Where do you think I can make some money? Hey, I've just got a little bit of money. What can I, earn? What can I do to earn more? How can I be successful at this? How can I be successful at that? So pretty common questions that come up and the answer for me is always the same. And this is the first of the five tips. They say, what can I do? What should I invest in? And I tell them the first thing you need to do is invest in yourself. So most people don't wanna take the time to actually learn investments and do research and all that stuff. They just want me to tell them the next stock that's gonna skyrocket, the next cryptocurrency that's gonna 100X, how can I invest in real estate with $50 a week? They wanna know how to get to the outcome, but not actually have to go through the process. And of course, it just doesn't work that way. There's a couple old sayings that are really interesting. One is, the more you learn, the more you earn. Now we change it a little bit and say, the more you learn and then apply, the more you earn. Because you gotta go out and get that knowledge and then do the work to actually apply it and get it working and then you start getting paid. There's another saying I really like, it's first you learn and then you drop the L. So people gotta realize that work, that effort, that learning, it has to come first. So normally when these conversations start out, I ask them a little bit about what they're doing to get ahead, what their schedule's like. I always ask people, hey, what book are you reading? And at least eight times out of 10, these people are like, well, I'm not reading a book. I'm like, hey, if you say you wanna get ahead in life, you're really committed, you really wanna grow your wealth, you wanna provide for your family, you have crazy aspirations of owning a mansion and driving Bugattis and all that stuff, but you can't tell me what book you're reading right now and you haven't read a book since you got out of high school, that is a major problem. And this is a big issue, it always has been, but it seems like especially nowadays, after people get done with their traditional schooling, they don't wanna learn anymore. They're not putting themselves in uncomfortable positions to where they're having to learn new lessons, try new things, possibly fail. People don't wanna do that. They just wanna clock in for their nine to five and that's it. But if you wanna get rich, you wanna get wealthy, that's not the way it's gonna work. So you may not have a lot of money, but I guarantee you can get a library card for less than $5. Start reading books. If you're on the road a lot, maybe you just have a long commute to and from work, even if it's just 15, 20 minutes, consider getting audible and doing audiobooks. If you've got a 20 minute commute to work, that's 20 minutes on the way there and 20 minutes on the way back. It's up to you to figure out how you wanna dedicate your time. So while some people will just jam the radio, listen to mindless music and just space out on the ride home so they can decompress, other people that wanna be successful and realize that is a valuable time will listen to an 
audiobook during that time. They'll utilize that time to gain additional knowledge. So super important. So if you're here and you're watching this video, you're already taking the first step. You may not be reading a book, but you're watching YouTube videos on a topic and that's research that you should be doing. If you're watching a lot of educational stuff on YouTube, that is quality, but I do recommend that you read some books and get on a cadence where you're at least reading one book a month. That's not a ton, that's 12 books a year. For me, I'm very busy and I'm doing a lot of research, but my average book reading per year is between 25 and 60 books a year. And it's been that way. I've been keeping up with that for the last 13 years. So if you wanna be successful, you gotta put in the work. So here's three book recommendations that I really like that I think uh, you should read if you haven't already. The first was one of my favorite books and one of the first ones I read. It is Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. It is one of the easiest reads, but one of the most impactful reads I've ever experienced in my life. So definitely check it out. In the book, Ro Robert talks about the difference between his biological father, who was an educator, but had the, the poor mindset, and his friend's dad, who was a business owner and had the entrepreneurial mindset. And he's really the guy that changed Robert Kiyosaki's life. So that's a really good one. Another one is The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. I like this because it applies to so many aspects in life. Whether you're talking about getting healthy, investments, relationships, all the tiny little decisions in life that you think are meaningless, they actually add up to make a major impact. So the book is a lot about recognizing those and developing habits that are going to be the most beneficial for you. And those lessons will help you in life, like I said, your health, your family, relationships, but also a lot, a tremendous amount in your investments. And the investment idea that I I will reference later has a lot to do with the compound effect. The third book is Extreme Ownership. This book was written by two Navy SEALs and they find an outstanding way to relate the lessons that they learned in battle to business and things you're probably going through every day in your corporate America life. So this one's especially impactful. If you have a day-to-day -day job, a nine to five, and you're finding yourself frustrated, this book will help you make sense of things and teach you some lessons that you really need to know. So check that one out too. So number one, again, was invest in yourself. You need to be spending time doing research, reading books, doing anything you can to make your mind sharper. Because if you gain that additional intelligence on your own, then when an opportunity presents itself, then you'll know exactly what to do already. So it's vitally important to keep educating yourself no matter what. Next up, the second tip is audit your expenses and just get your budget under control. There's so many people out there that make $100,000, $150,000 a year and they spend 110 or 160. They're not investing anything. They just have way too many liabilities in their life. So they drive the fanciest car they can. They rent the most expensive apartment. They're just on the absolute threshold of their income. So the next question I'm always asking people is tell me about your expenses. And what I find very interesting and extremely common is most people don't really know what their expenses are. They just rattle things off like, well, I got a car payment and a mortgage. I'm like, okay. How much are your credit card payments? Well, I don't know. When do they come out during the month? I'm not sure, I've just got it on auto pay. How much do you still owe on your car loan? I don't know, between 25 and 30,000. So if this is you and you fall in this category, you have got to get your stuff together. You have got to create a budget for yourself, whether that is in an Excel spreadsheet, you've got it written out on a notepad, you're using Google Docs, whatever it is, you need to have a very specific monthly budget that shows your assets and your liabilities incoming money and outgoing money. So I've created just like a really simple one here. This is kind of a dumbed down version of what I actually use on a monthly basis. But as you can see here, this is super simple, right? For the month of October, I've got a couple paychecks coming in. This one's for 2,500. This one's for 2,500. I get paid on the 1st and the 15th, right? This is an example that you could use. Um, let's say you've got a side business here. Maybe you're mowing lawns. Maybe you go to yard sales and resell stuff. Maybe you've got a little e-commerce store, whatever it is, you're doing a little something extra on the side. So your total month, uh, monthly income is 5250. After taxes, that's what's actually landing in your bank account. You need to have some sort of spreadsheet that's gonna tell you what's coming out and when it's actually coming out of your account. So one thing you'll notice here is that investments, I've got this $500 investment in here, $500 per month. Investments is the first thing on the list. You need to start treating investments like it's a bill that you absolutely have to pay. Like would you consider not paying your car payment? Probably not because they're gonna come repo your car. It needs to be that vitally important to you to succeed that this investment money comes out before your liabilities. So super, super important. When you build your little spreadsheet like this, your investments have to be number one. So once your investments are taken out, then you've got all your other bills. So this first paycheck, obviously you get that on October 1st. Um, you don't get the next one until the 15th. So you gotta make sure this stuff is covered. So this is 2,500 bucks a month. So your first paycheck is gonna cover your investments, your mortgage, and your visa bill. Your next paycheck that you're getting on the 15th, that's gonna cover your Amex, your, your daycare for your kids. We all know that's like a thousand bucks a month per kid. Any loans that you have, a car payment, insurance, etc. 
Unfortunately for you, you've been doing this side business that's given you a little extra capital and you're utilizing that for fun stuff. That's to take your kids to the arcade. That's for fun dinners. That's to take your kids to the movies. You need to still leave enough uh, left behind that you're actually gonna be able to enjoy life, but don't overindulge. Like a lot of people go out all the time and it's like they're celebrating, but they hate their jobs. They're unhappy with their life. They can't figure out how to get it together. It's like, why are you celebrating? Why don't you take the next couple years, work really hard, focus on your investments. And then when you're building real wealth and you actually have discretionary income where you can go on these big vacations, then you can celebrate and you can celebrate using the money that you made from investments. So again, this is super simple and this concept is simple. And some of you guys are like, ah, oh, this is information that's not important to me. But if you don't have some sort of spreadsheet like this that you're tracking your budget month in and month out, then you are doing yourself a disservice. So audit your expenses, track your expenses, and get your budget under control. Number three is create more disposable income. So there's a lot of ways to do that. Obviously, you could keep working on your side gig. You could work overtime hours at work. You could get a raise. You could go yard sailing. You could drive Uber. There's endless ways to make additional income, but the easiest one is to make additional income at the place you already work at. Some people are gonna say, oh, I went to my boss and I asked him for more money, and he said no. That is the absolute worst way to do that. You need to go to your boss, show them that you're adding more value, figure out at what level of value is that next pay raise. So if you go to your boss and say, hey, last year, Tom got a promotion to supervisor. I'm really happy for him, but I was wondering what steps can I take to add the value needed to become a supervisor? Then you can tell him what you've been working on. Listen, I've been reading a few books on leadership. I've been trying to get the concepts down so I can be a good leader if I'm ever given that opportunity. I've been doing a lot of research on YouTube. That research recommended that I get a certification. So I went online and did a little mini course. It only cost me like 50 bucks, but it was really helpful. So I'm working on trying to add as much value as possible, but I wanted to come to you and ask specifically, hey, what can I do to get to that next level? I know it might not be right now or even next month, but in 90 days, I'd like to be there. Is that possible? And can you help me get there? I've had a similar conversation like that a dozen times in my tenure in corporate America. Never once has a leader told me, one of my bosses, sorry, I can't help you. When you approach it in that way, where you're actually bringing them more value and not just asking for more money to do the exact same job, they're gonna wanna help you. So the easiest way to create more disposable income is to do that through your current employer, work more hours, offer more value, do everything you can to level up. If you're sitting here telling me, I've only got 50 bucks to invest because my job's so terrible, but you're late three days a week and you've been passed up for two promotions because your boss just doesn't see you put in the effort level, that is your problem. So make sure that you get your own house in order and get everything dialed in. So when you get that next promotion and you're now making an extra 5,000 or $10,000 a year, that money can now go straight into investments. You don't need to increase your style of living. You don't have to get a bigger apartment. You don't have to go get a new BMW. Just focus on investing until you're at a point where you can afford all the stuff that you really wanna have. So work on providing value. That's the most important thing. The next tip is a controversial topic because it goes against what your parents and grandparents have been telling you for years. The tip is savers are losers. Yep, I said it. People who save money are losers. There was at one point in a time in history when you could take money and shove it under your mattress and several years later it would still have a similar value. Those days are long gone. In the United States and in basically every other country, we print money out of thin air like it's going out of style. What that causes is absolutely insane inflation. So the more dollars that are printed, the more there are in circulation and the less they're worth. Money is supposed to be finite in nature, that's what gives it value, is because of its scarcity. But in something like 1971, Nixon took us off the remainder of the gold standard, killed the Bretton Woods Agreement, and now our money isn't tied to anything. We can print as much of it as we want. That causes crazy inflation, and our national debt is just astronomical. Now, I've done videos on this in the past, and I can do more in the future, but let me show you the calculator that actually shows the debt in the US. So I won't spend too much time on this, but you can see here, uh, this is the US national debt. It's basically increasing in real time. And this debt number right here is our current debt. That is $30.9 trillion. Debt per citizen, $92,740. Debt per taxpayer, $245,000. So if you're watching this, you're very likely a taxpayer. You, the debt that you owe the government is $245,000. Now, why do you owe the government so much? Well, the government's not like a business. It doesn't actually make any money. It has to take its money from people. And it does that in the form of taxes. Now, the government wants to spend a ton of money. Every program they have, every time they wanna send money to another country, every time they wanna hire 87,000 new people 
people for the IRS. All those expenses have to get paid from somewhere. Now, if they had to come to us first and say, hey, we're gonna raise your taxes, and that way that tax money is gonna be able to pay for all the stuff we wanna do, everyone would be like, no, absolutely not. Taxes are already high enough. So because they know you're gonna say no, and they wanna spend money we don't have, they just print it out of thin air. They go to the Federal Reserve, they have them print the dollars, or they type the numbers on the screen, and they create debt out of thin air. And we sell this debt to other countries like China, but that's another story. The point is these movie numbers on the screen, it just means the government's printing money. And because there's more dollars in existence, your dollar is now worth less. Remember back in the day when your grandparents would say, I remember buying candy bars for five or 10 cents. The reason they're not five or 10 cents anymore isn't because it's got more expensive to make them. The fact is our processes have actually become a lot more efficient. It used to be a lot more manual, more people would actually have to be involved to get you that product. Now we just have a machine that kicks them out you know, really fast. So the systems have gotten better and better over the time, but it's still getting more expensive and that has to do with inflation. Your dollars are worth a lot less than they were 10 years ago. And in 10 more years, they're gonna be worth a lot less than they are now. So since the Federal Reserve was introduced in the United States in 1913, our dollar has lost pretty close to 99% of its purchasing power. So hopefully that clarified it. That's why savers are losers. What you need to be doing is saving to invest. And that can be really hard for people on a low income. If you've got an extra 50, 100, $500 just sitting there in your savings account, there's a very good likelihood that if something co comes up, maybe a trip you wanna go on, maybe you're at you know, a night out with the friends and you're at the bar, you go to the ATM, pull a little extra cash out that you weren't planning on, something will come up. So what I recommend is for new investors, when you're just starting out, invest into things you can dollar cost average into. Dollar cost averaging is adding small investments over time. So let's say I wanna buy Apple stock. We'll just, for the example, say Apple stock's trading at 100 right now. So I buy one share at 100. Next week, it's it's uh, trading at 120. So I buy another one at 120. Then it dips down to 90. I buy one at 90. So it allows me to fractionalize my investment, to break it down into chunks. And dollar cost averaging helps us get an even number, gives us a better average investment. People get excited about investments. They go all in on the first day. Then three days later, the price drops. They're like, why didn't I wait to get in? On the other hand, they buy in at that lower price and then it goes up why didn't i buy everything before studies have shown and statistics show that most investments if you dollar cost average in make a lot of small purchases over time that it will give you an average buying price that is better than if you dumped it all in at one time so for new people that are starting out and making investments like that i recommend doing something that you can dollar cost average into and those are normally going to be stuff like stocks etfs indexes things like that in contrast you couldn't really dollar cost average into a real estate investment right you want to buy a rental property and rent it out, you really need to have a lump sum of 20% down and the credit to be able to get the loan and, and do all that. So most of you guys are like, man, I've got you know, 50, 100, $500 per month that I can allocate to investing. I don't have 50 grand to be able to put down on a rental property. So for you guys, skip the whole part where you move it into your savings account and, and you know do all that. When it hits your checking from your account, move that directly into an investment. Stocks and cryptos are really good avenues to take if you wanna do that. You've got really low cost free brokerages like Robinhood, which I don't love um, for some specific reasons, but if you're just buying and holding that it's good, there's basically no fees to purchase those stocks. You've got Webull. I personally use TD Ameritrade, but it's more for the pro professional trading that I'm doing, but they've got no fee stock purchase as well. So when you're looking into your first investments, consider something like that, something you can DCA into or put uh, little chunks of money into over time. And the last tip, number five, is just get started. A lot of people sit around forever doing research, 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 and they never get in to do an actual investment. And by the time they finally get around to it, they've wasted 10 years that they could have been investing and growing that through compound interest. So just get started. I recommend doing research first. So learn about your investments before you make them. Before you jump into an investment, go watch 10 YouTube videos on it. Read three books on it. Ask somebody that you know who knows what they're talking about. So if your uncle is a stock guy and you're looking at getting into stocks, do all the research first, watch the YouTube videos, read the books, do all that stuff, then go to your uncle and say, here's what I've learned. Am I thinking about this correctly? Can you give me any pointers? I'm looking at getting started. But do your own research. And I think it's important to say this, but be okay with losing a little bit of money along the way. You're not really losing that money, you're paying for a lesson. So be okay that if you buy the stock and it goes down and you lose the cash on that, it's not a big deal. Be okay with buying $100 of a crypto that you did some good research on, you thought it was gonna do well, 
and it turns out it didn't do well. That type of stuff is going to happen. There is risk involved. There's always risk involved with investments, no matter what type of investment it is. There's risk in real estate. You could buy a rental property and it could turn out to have a cracked foundation. You could buy a piece of land and it turns out it's not zoned correctly for the use you're trying to put up. You could buy stock in a company where something new comes out and just crushes that old business model. Think of Blockbuster and Netflix. If you're old enough and you remember Blockbuster video, we used to go in there and rent the new releases and take them home. And I thought Blockbuster would never go anywhere. Instead, Netflix came out where they mailed DVDs directly to your house and then eventually came out with a streaming service and they just smoked Blockbuster. So that can happen. A new company could come out and crush the old business model of the company that you got involved in and you put your money into. And that is gonna happen. Just do the research the best you can and get started. So like I said, if you're just getting into it and you're you're a beginner at the investments and you want to get into something, stocks are a really good idea. And for you guys who want to keep it really simple, I recommend investing in like index funds or ETFs. These are going to be a basket of different investments. So consider a uh, ticker symbol SPY. That's the S&P 500 ETF. Off the top of my head, I think they're trading for like 200 bucks a share. But this is going to give you exposure to big companies, the, the top 500 companies in the world. So think uh, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Visa, uh, companies like that. You gotta think there's 500 different companies like that in there. If one of those companies were to fail, then that, that loss would be padded by all the other companies in there doing well. And inevitably, inevitably, one of those other companies is gonna skyrocket and it's gonna offset that loss in Apple or Microsoft or whatever company goes down. So again, when you're first starting out, I highly recommend buying shares of ETFs in a sector that you choose. There's ETFs in healthcare, tech stocks. There's actually ETFs in real estate. If you wanna get involved in real estate, but don't have the money to go out and put a down payment on a rental property. And that ticker symbol is IYR. So consider getting in and setting yourself up with a brokerage account and start to dabble very slowly, uh, you know, buy some stock shares. If you really like Tesla and really like Elon Musk and you love what they're doing over there, buy a couple shares of Tesla. If you're really into Apple and you personally use all their products, you've done the research on the company, you feel good about it, buy some shares of Apple. Don't overcomplicate it. The more you look into it, the more it's going to start to make sense and you're going to start to really understand your investments. Personally, for me, I don't really like mutual funds or bonds uh, for low income players specifically. Mutual funds, because the fees behind them are outrageous. Nine times out of 10, you just buying an S&P 500 ETF is gonna outperform what the mutual fund's gonna do. And you can buy that ETF for free. There's no free. There's no fees on stock purchases on these platforms. So most of you guys could download Webull today, get your account verified, go on and buy one share of SPY and pay zero fees. It's gonna be a lot more difficult and more expensive for you to get set up in these mutual funds. So that's a much better path for me. Now for bonds, bonds are fixed income plays. And for me, they can be okay for rich people uh, who need a place to stick their money. But with the stated rate of inflation at like 8.25%, no bond is going to pay you that amount. So you're going to be putting your money into a bond and then five years later or whatever the term is, the money you get back is actually going to be less valuable than when you put it in. So in my mind, bonds don't make sense for folks with low income or smaller chunks of investment capital. So another option is cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are inherently risky. So you got to realize what you're getting into. Nine out of 10 projects will fail, but the one that succeeds has the potential to exceed, you know, 100x or 1000x. So really, really good money can be made in the cryptocurrency space as long as you're doing your due diligence and your research and you are willing to have a long time horizon on that investment. That means for almost every time you invest in a cryptocurrency, you need to be willing to let that money sit for five plus years. Think about it this way. 10 years ago, Bitcoin was worth, worth like a few cents. A couple years after that, it had gone up to a few dollars. So if you had put in $10,000, by the end of the first year, you might have been mad because you weren't really getting a good return from it. Now, if you had just waited the 10 years and waited till the peak of Bitcoin last November, then that same Bitcoin would be worth like $69,000. So keep in mind when you make these investments, they take time. That's not just cryptocurrency, that's stocks, that can be real estate. Investing is for the long term. You'll be much more successful that way. Now, the final investment type that we're going to cover is cutting edge. It's called decentralized finance. What it does, they're investments that utilize smart contracts on various blockchains. And in these investments, you're usually staking a certain type of cryptocurrency on a platform in order to generate a yield. So I have been investing in the decentralized finance space for about 14 months. And the example that I'm going to give you today is my favorite platform and protocol in the space. And this one is called Drip Network. Now, this is Drip Network. This is a daily ROI platform. 
what you're basically doing here is you're gonna buy a cryptocurrency token called Drip. You're then gonna stake that into the system here in your deposit section. What this smart contract tells it to do is to pay you out 1% on whatever your deposits are here. So currently this, uh, this investment is worth $41,130 and you're gonna notice it's gonna be ticking up and down because the market is always live in cryptocurrency. That's how much I've invested over time and I'm getting paid 1% per day off of this, meaning I'm earning about 55 drip tokens per day. Right now, drip tokens are trading for a little over $7. So you do the math, that's how you get to 41,000. And this platform will pay me out up to 300, 365% of whatever I have deposited here, whatever that total is. So currently right now I have 9.326 drip that are available and the US dollar value on that is about $69. So right now I have a choice to make. I can either take this money out, cash out of the system and then you you know use those dollars wherever I want. And that would be my short term gain. Or I can take this money, I can put it back into my deposits and now be earning 1% a day on that total. Now, Drip Network is a very interesting and very successful platform. It has now been around for 17 months. And because of that, it's the most sustainable platform in the DeFi space. So this would be another good investment to look into. It is high risk, but it is also extremely high reward. You can potentially take a very small investment amount, especially if your dollar cost averaging in and turn it into a large sum of money. So if we go over here, as you can see drip right now, the price is $7.37. So if, you're, if you've only got maybe $75 in disposable income per month and you wanna get into an investment like this, at these prices, you'd be able to purchase 10 tokens a month and stake them in the system. So this is just one example of a protocol in decentralized finance. This one is my personal favorite and that is because it's the most stable. It's been around the longest. The developer who created it is highly touted as the greatest developer in the space. And because of that, I've allocated to put tens of thousands of dollars into this investment. If you're interested in this investment, I will put a link to the video. The end screen will pop up the video, It'll show you how to get started, give you some more details about it. Also check out my YouTube channel because I've got like a hundred videos on the subject. So if it's something you're interested in, I would tell you to watch my videos, watch the other videos out there on YouTube. Do a good amount of research before you get into these projects. This is a brand new investment class. And like I said, while there is a lot of risk in these investments, it's also an incredibly high reward if they pay off. So anyway, guys, that is my five tips to low income investing. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Happy investing.